So I've been thinking a lot lately about the following question. What would happen if we came to disbelieve in free will? What would this mean for our interpersonal relationships, society, morality, meaning, and the law? For example, would giving up the belief in free will have dire consequences for society, as some think? Or would it rather have a humanizing effect on our practices and policies, freeing us from the negative effects of belief in free will? What I would like to propose today is that the belief in free will, rather than being a good thing, actually has a dark side and that we'd be better off without it. Now, I know that this is counterintuitive. Many people fear that life without free will would lead to nihilism, there'd be no reason to go on, or that it would undermine morality, or that we would just let criminals run free since there would be no moral responsibility. But I would like to paint a different picture for you today. And it begins with the idea of free will skepticism. So I'm a free will skeptic. I deny the existence of free will. Um, free will skeptics maintain that who we are and what we do is ultimately the result of factors beyond our control. And because of this, we're never morally responsible for our actions in the basic dessert sense. That is the sense that would make us truly deserving of praise and blame. Now, historically, there have been a number of philosophical and scientific arguments for free will skepticism, and I've promoted these arguments in my own work. But I'm not here today to try to convince you that you lack free will. That's not my goal. Um, I'm actually interested in a slightly different question. What would happen if we came to accept this perspective? What would happen, practically speaking, if we came to disbelieve in free will? Would it be, on the whole, a good thing or a bad thing? And it's here that I'm an optimist. I'm optimistic about the prospects of life without free will. So I call myself an optimistic skeptic. Um, as an optimistic skeptic, I maintain that life without free will is not only possible, but that it's preferable. Prospects of finding meaning in life and of sustaining good interpersonal relationships, for example, would not be threatened. And although certain systems of punishment, like those based on the model of retribution or just desserts would be ruled out, preventive detention and rehabilitation programs would still be justified, and I'll say a little bit more about these in a moment. Um, so as an optimistic skeptic, I maintain that life without free will um, may actually be good for our well-being and our relationships with others, since it could tend to eradicate an often destructive form of moral anger, a kind of moral anger that's corrosive to our relationships and to our social policies. Um, so to better understand the dark side of free will, what I want to do is just talk about some recent empirical work in moral and political psychology. And what this work has done is it actually has shown that there's a number of interesting and potentially troubling correlations between the belief in free will and people's other moral, religious, and political beliefs. In particular, what they found is that free will beliefs are correlated with higher levels of religiosity, punitiveness, and a number of conservative beliefs and attitudes such as just world belief and right-wing authoritarianism. Um, I'm only going to focus on two of these today. That is the connection between the belief in free will and punitiveness, and the connection between the belief in free will and what's called just world belief. Okay. So if we take punitiveness, for example, what this research has shown is that where belief in free will is strongest, we see increased punitiveness. That is, people are more likely to call for harsher forms of punishment in a number of different scenarios. And this makes sense. If you think people possess free will, then you believe they justly deserve to be praised and blamed for their actions. Um, and so if they engage in an immoral act, you want to see them get their just desserts, right? And it's very close to a notion of retribution. You want to inflict harm on them for the harm they've inflicted on others. But the downside of this is, again, it could create a moral anger that's destructive to our relationships with others and to our social policies. So consider this on a macro level. Um, Belief in uh, free will is relatively strong in the United States. In fact, it's built right into the mythology of the rugged individual, the self-made man, the cause of sui, the person who could pull themselves up from the bootstraps and overcome all of their life circumstances. But because we are so committed to this belief, we're also a relatively punitive society. Consider this one simple fact. The United States makes up about 5% of the world's population, yet it incarcerates 25% of the world's prisoners. I'll say that again because it's a rather startling statistic. We make up a relatively small sliver of the world's population, about 5%, but we house and imprison 25% of the world's prisoners. I don't think it's controversial to say that our criminal justice system is broken. It's not working. It's not making us safer. It's not reducing crime. It's by no means achieving our desired social goals, and it is not reducing the rate of recidivism, that is, repeat crime. But perhaps, just perhaps, if we would adopt a skeptical perspective, we might be able to adopt more effective and more humane policies. So let me just briefly sketch quickly how a, a free will skeptic might address criminal behavior. Um, there's a professor not too far from here. His name is Dirk Piraboom. He teaches at Cornell University. He's a free will skeptic like myself. 
And he proposes a model for dealing with dangerous criminals based on an analogy with quarantine. So people who contract contagious diseases do so for no fault of their own. They're not morally responsible for having done so. We don't think they deserve to be punished. But we do feel justified in quarantining those individuals for the safety of society. Well, we could say the same thing for dangerous criminals. That is, even if you adopted the perspective that I'm advocating, um, and you believe that individuals are not ultimately responsible for becoming who they are, we could still justify detaining those individuals for the safety of society. But if we did this, this would entail a number of major reforms, all of which I think are actually really important and good. Um, for one, we would have a duty to the well-being and the rehabilitation of criminals, um, just like you would have a duty to treat the person in quarantine for their disease. Secondly, <laughs> Secondly, um, uh, you would also have a, if you couldn't treat those individuals cruelly while being detained, just like you couldn't treat cruelly the people that we are uh, holding in quarantine. Thirdly, if there were less severe forms of punishment available, we'd have to opt for those less severe forms of punishment. And that might entail rethinking some of our harsher sentencing laws and some of our cru crueler forms of punishment in supermax prisons. And lastly, if you're someone like myself and you think it's the causal circumstances that drive these behaviors in the first place, then free will skeptics will put their money, their resources, and their focus on addressing the systemic causes that lead to criminality, wealth, inequality, educational inequity. So instead of uh, blaming people and punishing them on the tail end, you would try to prevent the criminal behavior in the first place. Oh. Thank you. So, not only do I think that free will skeptics can deal successfully with criminal behavior, I think they could do so more humanely and more effectively. So let me switch over to the other belief I mentioned, that belief in free will has also been shown through this research to correlate with what is known as just world belief. So what is just world belief? Well, fundamentally, it's the belief that the world is just, and good things happen to good people, and bad things happen to bad people. But also fundamentally, it's a blame the victim approach, since it maintains that individuals justly deserve what they get and that those who meet with misfortune have often brought it upon themselves. In the 1960s, psychologists developed what is known as the Just World Belief Scale. It was meant to design people's commitments to this type of belief, but it was also particularly designed to capture the natural tendency people have to blame those who meet with misfortune for their own circumstances. Um, and over the years, what they found is higher scores on this belief, higher scores on the Just World Belief Scale, correlate with likelihood of derogating innocent victims, uh, trusting current institutions and authorities, and blaming the poor and praising the rich for their respective fates. As I said, this is essentially a blame the victim approach. Um, and you can see manifestations of it all throughout society. One of the more pernicious is the tendency, both among ordinary folk and the legal system, to blame rape victims for their own circumstances. So if the world is just and good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people, to help to try to reconcile such a horrific act as rape while preserving the belief that the world is just, you turn that innocent victim into somebody that's guilty. They were dressed provocatively. They were walking where they shouldn't have been walking. And other manifestations of this blame the victim approach can be seen throughout society. For example, blaming those in poverty for their own circumstances, claiming that those who are on welfare are lazy or mooches, or blaming educational inequity on the children and parents themselves. But we all know, at least in our more rational, deliberative moments, that the world is not just, and that the lottery of life is not always fair. We need to acknowledge the role that luck plays in our lives and who we are and how we turn out. Right? We don't all have equal starting points. So, as I said in the beginning, I'm an optimist. I'm optimistic that if we could adopt a skeptical perspective, we may be able to free ourselves from some of these beliefs and harmful tendencies. In fact, there was a recent study that came out in the Journal of Psychological Science that found that by reducing people's beliefs in free will, it actually made them less punitive. They, they called for less harsh forms of treatment in a number of hypothetical scenarios. And this tells me two things. One, it reaffirms what I was saying earlier, that where belief in free will is strongest, we see increased punitiveness. But it also provides hope to me that we could perhaps relinquish ourselves of some of these more harmful beliefs and by doing so, lose some of that moral anger I've been discussing. So my proposal, my proposal is rather simple. Let's not fear free will skepticism, let's embrace it. Let's give up the belief in free will and with it the pernicious belief in just deserts, that people justly deserve what they get. Let's leave these antiquated notions behind, lose our moral anger and stop blaming the victim. And instead let's turn our attention to the difficult task of addressing the causes that lead to criminality, the causes that lead to wealth and equality, and the causes that lead to educational inequity. Once we relinquish the belief in free will, this will allow us to look more clearly at the causes and more deeply at the systems that shape individuals and their behavior. And this will allow us to adopt more humane and more effective policies in education, criminal justice, and social policy. Thank you very much.